Welcome back to Get Up. And if you're just joining us, let's relive it together. The moment that will be remembered forever. The final play of yesterday's Game 7. The game winner from Kawhi Leonard. Here's how it sounded in French Canada. Un second. Kawhi. That was well worth waiting for. <laughs> I threw to it too early, but candidly, I don't mind. We couldn't miss a second of it. What a remarkable finish that is. And let's bring Tim Legler into this to translate because he is fluent in French. And um, I think I just referred to it as French-Canadian, as though that's actually a language. So we're a little confused here this morning. Anyway, Legs, take us through something we do know. Diagram that play for us. How did Kawhi Leonard make that happen? Yeah, Greeny, too. A lot of people, it just looks like a great player making a great shot, but there's a lot of subtle things that Kawhi Leonard does on this play that allow this to happen. So I'm going to walk you through that. The first thing, and it sounds simple, but believe it or not, a lot of teams fail to do it. Get the ball in and get it to the guy you want to. So obviously, Philadelphia wants to deny Kawhi Leonard the ball, but he does something right here. It's very subtle, but you're going to see him stop and allow Ben Simmons to run into him. What does that do? It, it throws off Ben Simmons' timing so that he can't now get out here in this passing lane. So Kawhi Leonard's gonna break out. Ben Simmons only gets to about here, and that all is because Kawhi Leonard stops rather than just run out full speed and allow Ben Simmons to deny him. So that's the very first thing you have to do. Let's get the ball into the guy we want, and that's what happens here. Next, on the catch. Now, there's a rule in basketball, generally, it's one second per dribble. So you have an internal clock, so you know Kawhi Leonard is going to end up taking four dribbles. Why is that important? There's four seconds left. It gives him just enough time to get it off, so he knows that general basketball rule. Next, he spins away immediately. Why is that important? Because if Kawhi Leonard catches it and squares up right there, Ben Simmons jumps on his right hand, he'll force him back to the traffic on the left. So the fact that Kawhi immediately on the catch spins away, it gives him time to get over there. Next, here comes Joel Embiid. A lot of players, I think, would have probably just risen up right here and taken a fadeaway shot, no chance of going in. Kawhi Leonard understands he's got more time. And then the last thing is this right here. Watch Joel Embiid. I didn't notice this until I saw the replay. He's starting to jump right now. He mistimes it. So he takes a little hop. Why is that important? Because it throws off his timing so that Kawhi Leonard is going up as Joel Embiid is coming down. So on the second jump, he can't quite get there and it gives Kawhi Leonard just enough time to get this incredible shot off, and I can barely see it on the touchscreen. That's how high the basketball goes. And now the rest of this, yeah, some luck involved, some physics involved that really <laughs> defy logic, but fitting to me that Kawhi Leonard, who had one of the best series I've seen any player have in any round, in any year, ends the series that way. Yeah, look, the apex of that shot is 18.2 feet. And to your point about his series, only Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Michael Jordan ever scored more points in a single playoff series than Kawhi just did. Take, stay with me a minute here because I want to get your take on something else as well. I want to go back to Warriors-Rockets game six on Friday night. We touched on it a moment ago from the Warriors side of things. But I think there's an even more interesting story to tell from the Rockets side of things. At home, no Durant. Every opportunity in the world to at least extend this to seven. And in the fourth quarter, they just couldn't find any offense at all. It's just bad shot shot after bad look after bad pass if you feel like you're seeing the same play over and over again on their side of the floor it's because you were Steph Curry basically beats them all by himself with 33 points in the second half he was spectacular and then look at this a lazy entry pass this with a minute and a half left and your season hanging in the balance look at the life or lifelessness if you will of this Houston offense they just can't find anywhere to go with the basketball James Harden had four turnovers in the fourth quarter alone and that's how the Warriors wind up advancing to the conference finals again. The Warriors are the Rockets' white whale. In the last five seasons, Houston 0-4 in the playoffs against Golden State, 6-1 against everybody else. The only other loss coming to San Antonio in 2017. Take a listen here to Stephen A. on who should accept at least some of the blame for this loss. 
day when you're looking at the Houston Rockets, don't ignore Mike D'Antoni. Because now if you're looking at Mike D'Antoni and you're looking at the Houston Rockets, you have to look at Mike D'Antoni, you have to look at Daryl Morey, and you have to ask yourself this question. Can this system win? The answer is no. Absolutely not. Because they never have. It's that simple. Didn't win in Phoenix, didn't win in New York, didn't win in L.A. Hasn't won in Houston because the Golden State Warriors are standing in your way. That's Stephen A's take. Timmy Legler, I want yours. What do you make of that? Well, I think there's, there's several questions wrapped into one there. The first is, can the system win? No, I'm not a believer that a predictable offense that basically runs the same thing, that lacks player movement, is really the way to win in basketball. I just don't believe that's the style. But I will say this. There is a difference between what Phoenix was doing and what Houston was doing. Phoenix didn't look like this. Phoenix played fast up the floor. Steve Nash was a guy that was willing to give the ball up and move without the basketball and get it back later in the possession. So he, to me, was in a system that had much, a much greater chance of winning a championship. And if it wasn't for Amari Stoudemire getting suspended, maybe they were able to pull that off. When I look at the Houston Rockets, it's different. Because of James Harden's really lack or unwillingness to want to move without the basketball or play fast up the court, you now have a system that I think you can only run with James Harden. This is all he's going to do. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to envision James Harden off the ball, screening, cutting, going down to the baseline, coming out. He doesn't want to play that way. He plays slower up the floor, and he wants to play this style, and it really ties Mike D'Antoni's hands in terms of having – any sort of unpredictability with their offense. So the way it's currently constructed, no. They can't win a championship, but I also don't think there's another way now to coach James Harden or that he is willing to play, which makes it tough also for Mike D'Antoni. Really well done, Legs. Thanks a million for all of this this morning. We'll see you again really soon. Let me bring this to the table here. Bruce, you were demonstrative. I, uh, yeah, the, the whole Amari thing. Well, you know, I, I was on the floor then, Greeny. Right. He got suspended because he should have been suspended. Okay, fair enough. So we understand that. that so it, it, it was not unfair that just for stepping onto the court during that after you guys hip-checked Steve, Kerr, hip mean, Steve Nash, hip-checked Steve Nash into the Steve scorer's Nash table. Steve Nash ran into Robert Ori. Yes. And, and, and then ran into the scorer's table at no, full he speed. He sold that part. Okay. See, you, you know what? We used to be good in yes, Bristol. Right. Now you got into New York. You've changed, okay, man. Okay, fair enough. You've changed. Then let me get you back to what Tim Legler was talking about. Actually, you sit here a minute. Let me get back to you on what <laughs> Tim Legler was talking about. Because he's saying, basically, Mike D'Antoni's hands are tied. They can't try and do anything different. Is he right? Well, to a certain degree, you look at the strengths and weaknesses of the players you have and you build your system around that. So Mike played differently in Phoenix. Now he's playing to the strengths of this club. And this, this team is really the second best team in the West. And so I think you got to take a step back. And obviously they started off slowly when Chris Paul was hurt. And then they had a great finish to the season. But this should have been the conference final in my eyes. And so it wasn't. And I think they have to add depth to their team with, with their second unit. Well, what do you think? I think that you, as a player, as an elite player coach, it is your responsibility to change whatever it is that you need to change. Now, in OKC, James Harden was good. They got to the finals when he was a role player. Not a, he was a bigger piece than mm -hmm. just a role player, but they got to the finals. So he can't adapt. Now, you have to hold players accountable to adapt. You were talking about elite players that can do multiple things on the floor. You mean to tell me now because you swing the ball, now you got to move? Now he can't do that? No, he can do that. It's just a matter of him doing it. And it's having a coach that's going to say, James, I don't want you dribbling, dribbling, dribbling. Let's get off the ball, move. Because that's what Golden State did to us, and we had a hard time guarding that. Uh, it's a part of, I agree with what you're saying, Tibbs, and I think it's important to point out that, that history might show there were a lot of teams that didn't win because Golden State put together this historically great team. Everyone is going to wind up losing to them during this period of time. The Rockets were the next closest thing. If, if the Warriors break up, then I think the Rockets do feel like they're next in line. So I don't think it's time to break them up. I will say, however, that if you're going to put together a report explaining how the referees cost you Game 7 last year and then leak the news of that report yourself and then talk about the officials and talk about the injury to Chris Paul, you cannot lose at home. A game in which Kevin Durant doesn't play and Steph Curry is scoreless. You cannot lose that game at that, all. And that's accountability. Great coaches, Pat Riley, Greg Popovich, Larry Brown. They never complain when they lost. You never heard any cries and whimpers, whimpers coming out of the winning locker room because they did what was necessary. They took their lumps and they got better. That's what it's all about right now. It's not about sending tapes and all this stuff, man. Play the game the way it's supposed to be played and stop crying. Yeah, listen, I mean, that's part of it I agree with you on. At the end of the day, got my blood sugar we, up, right? We now. are all going to be. 
Ooh, we We're all going to be real uninterested in what they have to complain about coming out of this series. All right, I'll remind you that tomorrow night is a huge night for the NBA on ESPN. It starts with countdown at 7 Eastern, then the jump live from Chicago, and then the 2019 NBA Draft Lottery, otherwise known as the Zion Lottery. <laughs> uh, and then it's game one of the West Conference Final. Everything is streaming live on the ESPN app, so you can watch from anywhere. As we go, back to the agony of defeat. Joel Embiid and the Sixers lose at the buzzer. But we'll tell you why their problems started from the opening tip. That and more. Get up on ESPN.